the Vijayanagara Empire was an empire based in South India, in the Deccan Plateau region. It was established in 1336 by Hari Hara I and his brother Bukharaya I of Sangama dynasty. The empire rose to prominence as a culmination of attempts by the southern powers to ward off Islamic invasions by the end of the 13th century. It lasted until 1646 although its power declined after a major military defeat in 1565 by the Deccan Sultanates. The empire is named after its capital city of Vijayanagara, whose ruins surround present-day Hampi, now a World Heritage Site in Karnataka, India. The writings of medieval European travelers such as Domingo Pays, Fernão Nunes and Niccolò da Conti and the literature in local languages provide crucial information about its history. Archaeological excavations at Vijayanagara have revealed the empire's power and wealth. The empire's legacy includes many monuments spread over South India, the best known of which is the group at Hampe. The previous temple building traditions in South India came together in the Vijayanagara architecture style. The mingling of all faiths and vernaculars inspired architectural innovation of Hindu temple construction, first in the Deccan and later in the Dravidian idioms using the local granite. Efficient administration and vigorous overseas trade brought new technologies such as water management systems for irrigation. The empire's patronage enabled fine arts and literature to reach new heights in Kannada, Telugu, Tamil and Sanskrit. While Carnatic music evolved into its current form, the Vijayanagara Empire created an epoch in South Indian history that transcended regionalism by promoting Hinduism as a unifying factor. Alternative name Karnata Empire was another name for the Vijayanagara Empire. Used in some inscriptions and literary works of the Vijayanagara times including the Sanskrit work Jambavati Kalyanam by King Krishna Devaraya and Telugu work Vasucharitamu. History Differing theories have been proposed regarding the Vijayanagara Empire's origins. Many historians propose Hari Hara I and Bukka, the founders of the empire, were Kanadagas and commanders in the army of the Hoysala Empire stationed in the Tangabhadra region to ward off Muslim invasions from the northern India. Others claim that they were Telugu people first associated with the Karkatiya kingdom who took control of the northern parts of the Hoysala Empire during its decline. Irrespective of their origin, historians agree the founders were supported and inspired by Vidyaranya, a saint at the Stringiri Monastery to fight the Muslim invasion of South India. Writings by foreign travelers during the late medieval era combined with recent excavations in the Vijayanagara Principality have uncovered much-needed information about the empire's history fortifications, scientific developments and architectural innovations. Before the early 14th century rise of the Vijayanagara Empire, the Hindu states of the Deccan, the Yadava Empire of Divajiri, the Karkatiya dynasty of Warangal, the Pandyan Empire of Madurai, and the tiny kingdom of Kampili had been repeatedly invaded by Muslims from the north and by 1336 they had all been defeated by Alauddin Uddin Dinkilji and Muhammad bin Tufluk, the sultans of Delhi. The Hoysala Empire was the sole remaining Hindu state in the path of the Muslim invasion. After the death of Hoysala King Virabalala III during a battle against the Sultan of Madurai in 1343, the Hoysala Empire merged with the growing Vijayanagara Empire. In the first two decades after the founding of the empire, Harihara I gained control over most of the area south of the Tungabhadra River and earned the title of Purvapashima Samudradishavara. By 1374 Bukharaya I, successor to Hari Hara I, had defeated the chief Damavakit, the Reddies of Khandavaju, the Sultan of Madurai and gained control over Goa in the west and the Tungabhadra Krishna River Dhub in the north. 
The original capital was in the Principality of Arnagondi on the northern banks of the Tung Arbadra River in today's Karnataka. It was later moved to nearby Vijayanagara on the river's southern banks during the reign of Bukharaya I. With the Vijayanagara kingdom now imperial in stature, Harihara II, the second son of Bukharaya I further consolidated the kingdom beyond the Krishna River and brought the whole of South India under the Vijayanagara umbrella. The next ruler, Devaraya I, emerged successful against the Gajapatis of Odisha and undertook important works of fortification and irrigation. Italian traveller Niccolo de Conti wrote of him as the most powerful ruler of India. Devaraya II succeeded to the throne in 1424 and was possibly the most capable of the Sangama dynasty rulers. He quelled rebelling feudal lords as well as the Zamoran of Calicut and Quillan in the south. He invaded the island of Lanka and became overlord of the kings of Burma at Pegu and Tanasirim. The empire declined in the late 15th century until the serious attempts by Commander Saluva Nursimha Deva Raya in 1485 and by General Tulava Narasa Nayaka in 1491 to reconsolidate the empire. After nearly two decades of conflict with rebellious chieftains, the empire eventually came under the rule of Krishna Deva Raya, the son of Tulava Narasa Nayaka. In the following decades the Vijayanagara Empire dominated all of southern India and fought off invasions from the five established Deccan Sultanates. The empire reached its peak during the rule of Krishna Devaraya when Vijayanagara armies were consistently victorious. The empire annexed areas formerly under the sultanates in the northern Deccan and the territories in the eastern Deccan, including Kalinga, while simultaneously maintaining control over all its subordinates in the south. Many important monuments were either completed or commissioned during the time of Krishna Devaraya. Krishna Devaraya was followed by his younger half brother Akiuta Devaraya in 1529. When Akiuta Devaraya died in 1542, Sadashi Varaya, the teenage nephew of Akiuta Raya, was appointed king, though real power was wielded by Rama Raya, Krishna Devaraya's son in law. When Sadashiva was old enough to claim absolute power, Aliya Rama Raya had him imprisoned and became the de facto ruler. Eager to take advantage of the disunity among the sultanates of Bijapur, Ahmednagar, Bure, Gokonda, and Baidar, Rama Raya involved himself in the political affairs of the powers across the Krishna River to the north. His ploy of supporting militarily one sultanate against another, often changing alliances, brought rich rewards for a while. However, by 1563, exhausted with his intrigues, the bitter rivals from the north formed an alliance. They marched against Rama Raya and clashed with the Vijayanagara's forces in January 1565. The capture and killing of Aliya Rama Raya in the famous Battle of Talikatad after a seemingly easy victory for the Vijayanagara armies created havoc and confusion in the Vijayanagara ranks, which were then completely rooted. The Sultanate's army later plundered Hampi and reduced it to the ruinous state in which it remains. It was never reoccupied. Tirumala Deva Raya, Rama Raya's younger brother who was the sole surviving commander, left Vijayanagara for Panukonda with vast amounts of treasure on the back of 1,500 elephants. The empire went into a slow decline regionally, although trade with the Portuguese continued, and the British were given a land grant for the establishment of Madras. Tirumala Deva Raya was succeeded by his son Sri Rangarai later followed by Venkata II who was the last king of Vijayanagara Empire, made his capital Chandragiri and Velour, repulsed the invasion of the Deccan Sultanates and saved Panukonda from being captured. His successor Rama Deva Raya took power and ruled until 1632, after whose death Venkata III became king and ruled for about ten years. The empire was finally conquered by the sultanates of Bijapur and Gokonda, the largest feudatories of the Vijayanagara Empire, the Mysore Kingdom, Kaladi Nayaka, Nayaks of Madurai, Nayaks of Tanyur, 
Nayakas of Chitradurga and Nayak Kingdom of Jinji declared independence and went on to have a significant impact on the history of South India in the coming centuries. These Nayaka kingdoms lasted into the 18th century while the Mysore Kingdom remained a princely state until Indian independence in 1947 although they came under the British Raj in 1799 after the death of Tipu Sultan. Governance the rulers of the Vijayanagara Empire maintained the well-functioning administrative methods developed by their predecessors, the Hoysala, Kalkatiya and Pandya kingdoms, to govern their territories and made changes only where necessary. The king was the ultimate authority, assisted by a cabinet of ministers headed by the prime minister. Other important titles recorded were the chief secretary and the imperial offices. All high-ranking ministers and officers were required to have military training. A secretariat near the king's palace employed scribes and officers to maintain records made official by using a wax seal imprinted with the ring of the king. At the lower administrative levels, wealthy feudal landlords supervised accountants and guards. The palace administration was divided into 72 departments each having several female attendants chosen for their youth and beauty who were trained to handle minor administrative matters and to serve men of nobility as courtesans or concubines. The empire was divided into five main provinces, each under a commander and headed by a governor, often from the royal family, who used the native language for administrative purposes. A Raja was divided into regions, and further divided into counties themselves subdivided into municipalities. Hereditary families ruled their respective territories and paid tribute to the empire while some areas, such as Kaledi and Madurai, came under the direct supervision of a commander. On the battlefields, the king's commanders led the troops. The empire's war strategy rarely involved massive invasions, more often it employed small-scale methods such as attacking and destroying individual forts. The empire was among the first in India to use long-range artillery commonly manned by foreign gunners. Army troops were of two types. The king's personal army directly recruited by the empire and the feudal army under each feudatory. King Krishna Devaraya's personal army consisted of 100,000 infantry, 20,000 cavalrymen and over 900 elephants. This number was only a part of the army numbering over 1.1 million soldiers, a figure that varied as an army of 2 million has also been recorded along with the existence of a navy as evidenced by the use of the term Navigator Prabhu. The army recruited from all classes of society, and consisted of archers and musketeers wearing quilted tunics, shieldmen with swords and poignards in their girdles, and soldiers carrying shields so large as that no armor was necessary. The horses and elephants were fully armored and the elephants had knives fastened to their tusks to do maximum damage in battle. The capital city was completely dependent on the water supply systems constructed to channel and store water, and ensure a consistent supply throughout the year. The remains of these hydraulic systems have given historians a picture of the prevailing surface water distribution methods in use at that time in South India's semi-arid regions. Contemporary records and notes of foreign travelers describe how huge tanks were constructed by laborers. Excavations have uncovered the remains of a well-connected water distribution system existing solely within the royal enclosure and the large temple. Complexes with sophisticated channels using gravity and siphons to transport water through pipelines. The only structures resembling public waterworks are the remains of large water tanks that collected the seasonal monsoon water and then dried up in summer except for the few fed by springs. In the fertile agricultural areas near the Tungabhadra River, canals were dug to guide the river water into irrigation tanks. These canals had sluices that were opened and closed to control the water flow. In other areas the administration encouraged the digging of wells monitored by administrative authorities. 
Large tanks in the capital city were constructed with royal patronage while smaller tanks were funded by wealthy individuals to gain social and religious merit. Economy The empire's economy was largely dependent on agriculture. Sorghum, cotton and pulse legumes grew in semi-arid regions, while sugarcane, rice and wheat thrived in rainy areas. Patel leaves, arica, and coconut were the principal cash crops and large-scale cotton production supplied the weaving centers of the empire's vibrant textile industry. Spices such as turmeric, pepper, cardamom and ginger grew in the remote Mulnard Hill region and were transported to the city for trade. The empire's capital city was a thriving business center that included a burgeoning market in large quantities of precious gems and gold. Prolific temple building provided employment to thousands of masons, sculptors, and other skilled artisans. Land ownership was important. Most of the growers were tenant farmers and were given the right of part ownership of the land over time. Tax policies encouraging needed produce made distinctions between land use to determine tax levies. For example, the daily market availability of rose petals was important for perfumers, so cultivation of roses received a lower tax assessment. Salt production and the manufacture of salt pans were controlled by similar means. The making of ghee, which was sold as an oil for human consumption and as a fuel for lighting lamps, was profitable. Exports to China intensified and included cotton, spices, jewels, semi-precious stones, ivory, reno, horn, ebony, amber, coral, and aromatic products such as perfumes. Large vessels from China made frequent visits, some captained by the Chinese Admiral Zheng He, and brought Chinese products to the empire's 300 ports, large and small, on the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal. The ports of Mangalore, Honavar, Barkal, Barkhua, Kochi, Kananur, Makilapipnam and Dharmadam were the most important. When merchant ships docked, the merchandise was taken into official custody and taxes levied on all items sold. The security of the merchandise was guaranteed by the administration officials. Traders of many nationalities settled in Calicut, drawn by the thriving trade business. Shipbuilding prospered and keeled ships of 1,000 to 1,200 bar Aries were built without decks by sewing the entire hull with ropes rather than fastening them with nails. Ships sailed to the Red Sea ports of Aden and Mecca with Vijayanagara goods sold as far away as Venice. The empire's principal exports were pepper, ginger, cinnamon, cardamom, myribalin, tamarind timber, anafistula, precious and semi-precious stones, pearls, musk, ambergris, rhubarb, alio, cotton cloth and porcelain. Cotton yarn was shipped to Burma and indigo to Persia. Chief imports from Palestine were copper, quicksilver, vermilion, coral, saffron, colored velvets, rose water, knives, colored camlets, gold and silver. Persian horses were imported to Kananur before a two-week land trip to the capital. Silk arrived from China and sugar from Bengal. East Coast trade hummed, with goods arriving from Gokonda where rice, millet, pulse and tobacco were grown on a large scale. Dye crops of indigo and che root were produced for the weaving industry. A mineral-rich region, Makilipitnam was the gateway for high-quality iron and steel exports. Diamond mining was active in the Kolyur region. The cotton weaving industry produced two types of cottons, plain calico and muslin. Cloth printed with colored patterns crafted by native techniques were exported to Java and the Far East. Gokonda specialized in plain cotton and pulication printed. The main imports on the East Coast were non-ferrous metals, camphor, porcelain, silk and luxury goods.